So the last thing for me to mention before I pass you over to Rodrigo um, is the free giveaway that you've probably all seen on the invite. So all of you attending tonight will be entered into a draw to win a full uh, Acumas setup, which will include 40 plates and the incubator required to run the plates. So that's all from me from now. I will pass you over to Rodrigo. Uh, remember, if you've got any questions, just type them into the box as we go along. And lastly, can I just also ask if you're not already muted, I think a lot of you already are, if you could just mute your microphones to avoid any, uh, any noise or disruption, that'd be great. Now, over to you, Rodrigo. All right, now you can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Just say, shake your head. All right. Uh, well, you know, this is an awkward way to do this, but I guess it in increases efficiency a little bit. I hope you're all uh, safe and mentally health or healthy because uh, it has been a challenge for me to maintain my mental health uh, through this uh, pandemic period. And I can't wait to get back on the road and, uh, talk to my colleagues, uh, veterinarians and farmers in different countries again, uh, and actually shake people's hand and uh, look people in the eye and share experiences in person. And that's really what I miss. Um, you know, in the, this last four months have been brutal for me. Uh, but, oh well, it's a small um, sacrifice. It's gonna go away. We're gonna go back to normal at some point. So. My name is Rodrigo Bicalio. I'm, I've been a professor here at Cornell uh, University for uh, 12 years as a professor. And I've been at Cornell for a total of 17 years. I did my residency in population medicine in the ambulatory clinic here for two years and a PhD in epidemiology here. I was hired uh, one day after my graduation. I had a graduation ceremony on a Sunday and I was working as an assistant professor on a Monday following my uh, PhD graduation. I have been, my interests um, is all things related to dairy cattle. Uh, you know, I've done work uh, on lameness, lots of lameness work, but I also have done work, tremendous amount of work on mastitis, pneumonia, diarrhea in calves, calf health. So my, my major interest right now is immune modulation and microbiology. So vaccine development, uh, immune modulation development, uh, we, we work a lot of with recombinant cytokines and recombinant proteins and so on. So today I'm, I'm, our laboratory here is very uh, microbiology immunology oriented. So today I'm gonna share some experience uh, and some research that was done in our lab and some of my personal beliefs as well. Uh, and some of the tools that we have developed in the lab that we're fortunate enough to be able to license it from Cornell and found a company uh, by the demand of the local dairy farmers actually that require, you know, that uh, requested from us that we provide this product uh, commercially available for them. So it's been uh, quite a ride to, and, 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 and a learning curve to shift away from academia and now do uh, a little bit of business as well. And that has been very uh, productive and um, great experience. So, Mastitis. Let's talk. Let's talk about mastitis. We're going to have time to talk uh, to have questions in the end. Let's talk a little bit about mastitis. I, I love mastitis, and I tr I stayed away from mastitis for the very beginning of my career, and then I said, well, I give up. You know, there's no way to be involved in the dairy industry, and and close your eyes to mastitis. Mastitis is by far the biggest disease uh, that that uh, inf that you know affects dairy cattle all over the world. So in the U.S it's easily estimated that we lose about $2 billion a year just because of mastitis. And it's a tremendous problem and the biggest problem in the dairy industry anywhere in the world. So if we break it down, you know, we're gonna see, it's important to say that mastitis, as you all know, it's a, it looks like the audience for the most part is, uh, you know, veterinarians, fellow colleague veterinarians, so you know that. So not all cases of mastitis are equal. Mastitis is a syndrome basically a you know a sign that the cow develops inflammation changes in the secretion of milk and sometimes associated with systemic uh, changes in in the animal as well fever uh, dehydration depression lack of appetite 
but it could go from a you know a clinical score of one, which is basically just altered milk secretion, uh, to a clinical score of three, which is basically uh, you know associated with very altered milk secretion, inflammation of the mammary gland, uh, endotoxemia with fever, dehydration, and so on. So, what's the difference? Well, the difference is the mastitis. What kind of mastitis that animal has? So. If it is a mild case of a non aureus staphylococci, you may have a uh, very little economic losses associated with that mastitis. But if it is a grade three mastitis caused by Klebsiella pneumoniae, you're going to have tremendous losses. You know, we lose half of those cows. 50% of those cows are cold and they never return nor to normal milk production. Uh, so it could vary from, you know, a few cases to hundreds of dollars, up to $400 a, ca a case. Uh, it depends on the disease and the microbiology of the disease affecting the animals. Now, the interesting thing about mastitis is it is by far the most studied disease of dairy cattle. There is, you know, I, I did a, uh, a keynote presentation for the World Bariatrics. If I'm not mistaken, it was in, in Portugal, Lisbon, a while ago. And I was comparing a uh, number of scientific articles published by disease, you know, lameness, reproduction, uh, you know, infertility, and mastitis. And by far, mastitis is the number one uh, uh, study disease of dairy cattle. So as of 2019, there were 40,000 scientific papers published, and it still remains the most relevant disease of dairy cattle. So, what you know how how are we failing you know, after so many years of investment research publications understanding how come the mastitis persists as the number one disease well because mastitis is really a moving target you know it's not one simple disease and there's no way to get rid of it and we've made tremendous progress controlling contagious uh, causes of mastitis such as streptococcus agalactiae and staphylococcus aureus you know, in the U.S., we rarely, if uh, any, you know, we're not, we don't see streptococcus agalactiae. It's pretty much eradicated. Now, when you eradicate this contagious cause of mastitis, such as streptococcus you basically clean that mammary gland from the presence of high counts of somatic cell counts. You've, you're probably making those animals more susceptible for environmental opportunistic pathogens. So we're seeing a lot more Klebsiella, we're seeing a lot more E. coli, and particularly Streptococcus uberis, which is also another environmental pathogen, we see a lot of those cases. So the void that is left over, particularly in the immune system of that mammary gland, when you eliminate the contagious causes of mastitis, makes animals susceptible for environmental uh, opportunistic pathogens. You know, that incredibly low somatic cell counts you typically leads to more environmental mass time. So, you know, for us veterinarians, this means job security because it looks like we're going to, to be dealing with uh, mastitis for a while, uh, regardless of uh, the small progress we're making um, year after year. So prevention is a moving target. Disease in farm animals are dynamic and multifactorial. Uh, and often the void created by preventing some of the contagious pathogens is filled by other pathogens, opportunistic pathogens. Now, I, I like to, to use this iceberg uh, analogy here. And clinical mastitis, which is what the farmer sees and often, particularly in Europe, still calls a veterinarian to uh, visit the dairy farm and, and sometimes to examine a cow that is sick. It's the very tip of the iceberg. The, the larger part of the problem is what I call, you know, it's involved with herd microbiology and has to do with uh, milking routine, has to do with the kind of bedding that is used, hygiene, how clean the cows are, what kind of uh, microbiology that is going on around the, the cows, uh, both associated with environmental mastitis problems, but obviously with contagious causes of mastitis. We're going to try to address both, but uh, we're limited in time here. We'll see how much we can talk about. All right, so the most important thing is, you know, and I, I like to, to start this talk talking about the microbes because they are the ones that cause mastitis. Mastitis is basically caused by a pathogen entering the mammary gland through the, uh, the teeth canal and causing a disease. 
And we can divide, doesn't matter if you're in the UK or, or in the US, in New York State or in Japan or in Uruguay or in Argentina or in China, which I've been um, to all these places. And, and it's amazing how the microbiology of mastitis is exactly the same. There is no Chinese microbe that is exotic and different. It's basically caused by all the same microbes. So if I take 100 cases of clinical mastitis and I culture them, regardless of the country, you may find some variation farm to farm, but the, 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 the average is all gonna be the same. 100 cases of clinical mastitis culture anywhere in the world typically yields the following. Between 30% and 50% of these clinical mastitis milk samples are not going to have bacteria in their um, uh, milk anymore. This, if you culture that sample, or if you do anything, molecular, uh, if you do microbiome or do whatever you do to those samples, you're not going to identify a pathogen associated with uh, that infection. Those are culture negative. Today, we know that those culture negative cases are uh, cases of self-cure. Uh, we're gonna see that inflammation has a much, much, much longer uh, time for convalescence or, or recovery compared to infection. So if a cow is challenged with a, a small CFU dose of E. coli, she may activate the immune system very fast, clear the infection, have no more bacteria in there, uh, but she still has inflammation. That inflammation is reflected as mastitis, as you know, clots and uh, uh, flakes in the milk. So when you culture that milk, you're not gonna find E. coli anymore because the immune system has already done its job. That cow has already self-cured itself, but she needs time to resolve the inflammation. So those are culture negatives. And depending on how good the immune system of the herd is and how good the diagnosis of mastitis, clinical mastitis is in that herd, it could be up to 60% of the clinical mastitis cases. Uh, see anywhere from 20% to 60% of clinical mastitis being associated with no growth or culture negative. Right? If you go over to the uh, other 50% of the cases, now we're gonna have a pretty even breakdown between gram negative pathogens. These are environmental opportunistic gram negatives, usually coliforms. Uh, the vast, the majority of the cases, about 55 to 60% of these gram negative cases are E. coli. And the other half is Klebsiella. Of course, that depending on the herd, you may have Pseudomonas, you may have Enterobacter, you may have uh, Serratia and other kinds of gram negative, but the bulk of these two, uh, the, these gram negative infections are E. coli and Klebsiella. And then another uh, one third or so, 30% of whatever, half of what's uh, left over, it's gonna be gram positive microbes. If you have a herd that don't have a problem with contagious mastitis, uh, in other words, they don't have strep egg or staph aureus or mycoplasma bovis any longer. Then you're going to be dealing with the uh, non staph aureus uh, staphylococci, uh, non aureus staphylococcus, and strep uberus and strep dysgalactia are going to be the bulk of the cases there. All of these gram positive, non contagious gram positives, they have to be treated with antibiotics, whereas the gram negatives, particularly E. coli, do not require antibiotic therapy. Clubzella is questionable and probably requires antibiotic therapy. And then you have some contagions. And so in, in sense, if you go to a farm and you're able to uh, culture and identify the disease, the pathogen that is causing the disease, uh, you may be able to drop antibiotic use by 70%, anywhere between 40% in the uh, low case, if you don't treat uh, culture negative and E. coli cases, all the way up to um, 60%. So important to know what's causing mastitis. Now let's review, I like, uh, I think this is one of the best papers on selective mastitis therapy that have been published recently. I like this article a lot because um, it's a large study. You know, there's about 500 cows that were uh, randomly allocated into blindly receiving uh, Saftiofur, which is, you know, the Cadillac drug in, in mastitis therapy in the US, the best, the, the broad spectrum drug, for five days they were treated, regardless of the cause, versus um, selectively treating only gram positive with a narrow spectrum uh, antimicrobial. So they went to a, 
uh, dairy farm. It's one of our clients, actually, Willet Dairy Farm. They milk in this one farm. Uh, now they're milking close to 4,000 cows. Mastitis was diagnosed by the, the milkers in the milking parlor, right? And so they basically, they force stripped every cow. And if they find any clinical mastitis, they were flagged. Those cows that were flagged as clinical mastitis were re-examined by a herdsman. This is basically a trained employee that performs diagnosis and treatments in the farm. And then she was randomly allocated into one of two treatment groups. Treatment one, it went to a blanket therapy. In the blanket therapy, it was immediately after enrollment treatment with uh, ceftriofur into the affected quarter, one time a day for five days. So in this case, they're, uh, they're basically doing, you know, you have mastitis, you get treated kind of thing. And then the other half of the cows were randomly allocated to selective therapy. What's the selective therapy? Well, a milk sample was collected and was sent to the laboratory. In this case, it was actually done in the laboratory here at Cornell, QMPS. And it took about three days to return a, a result on average from the cow. During this period, the cow was not treated whatsoever. She did not receive any antibiotic therapy. She was waiting for the culture results to return. And if a cow was infected with a non-contagious gram-positive bacteria, for the most part was strep galactic and strep uberis, uh, she was treated with one tube every two hours for a day, basically two tubes of cefepirin, uh within 24 hours. That's it. It's a drug here. It's a mock, uh, Seth appearing, if I'm not mistaken, the commercial name is today. Gram-negative pathogens were not treated with antibiotics and uh, culture-negative cows were not treated with antibiotics. So what happened to this? Well, very interesting uh, results. We had um, nearly 500 cows enrolled in the study. Blanket therapy, 243 cows, 50% of the enrolled. Uh, these cows received five uh, tubes of antibiotic therapy, ceftriofur, one tube per day for five days. So you can do the math here, right? So it's about um, um, over a thousand tubes of uh, about 12, uh, 1,250 tubes of antibiotic that was used to treat these cows. The pathogen based, there were 246 cows. However, only 79 cows received antibiotic therapy. Now we're talking about you know, less than 30% of the cows treated with antibiotics and 70% of the cows uh, not uh, receiving any kind of antibiotic therapy because we're only treating gram positives based on culture results. So we look at the breakdown, like I told you, it doesn't matter if you're uh, where you are in the world, it usually breaks down the same way. Uh, culture negative was about a quarter of the cases both in both groups non-significant group, which is actually adds up to the uh, culture negatives. Uh, this is um, the CNS, coagulase negative staphylococci, or non oral staphylococci, uh, very little. And then the bulk of the cases are streptococcus genus infections, 30%, gram-negative bacillus, which is basically E. coli and and so on. So the breakdown uh, between the two groups was similar. Now, what happened to these animals clinically? Well, you can see that uh, uh, clinical days, this is basically the number of days that the animal had uh, altered milk secretion. In the selective therapy group, 4.5 days on average, and blanket therapy, 4.8. Again, this was, this was in a statistical tendency, but it was a tendency against blank, blanket therapy. When you look at milk production, there was no difference whatsoever. This is milk production after diagnosis of mastitis. And when you look at linear score, which is basically the log base 10 of the somatic cell count, uh, after diagnosis, there was no difference. Now, this is interesting, and this, this tended to be statistically significant again. Uh, the odds of death or culling was numerically higher for blanket therapy. It's almost 6% versus 3.7% in pathogen-based therapy. And 60 days after therapy, again, 11% for blanket therapy and 9% for pathogen-based. Now, I have a theory, and this is a philosophy of mine, actually. Everywhere I go and talk to farmers and veterinarians, they say, well, animals that benefit from intervention 
um, uh, will you know will get better with an intervention. However, when an intervention is not required and you intervene, uh, typically there's nothing uh, for that animal to gain. Uh, she that animal is only going to be losing because we don't have um, you know if a, if a cow is culture negative. She doesn't have a pathogen, and you stick a tube in her uh, teeth canal every day for five days. Uh, chances are that you're actually going to inflict damage to that cow, and maybe you, what you're going to do is you're going to introduce an infection to that cow. We're talking about 35% of the animals here that have no bacteria in their mammary gland, but you're sticking a tube in that uh, mammary gland every day for five days anyway. So interventions when they're not required, especially invasive interventions like this one, uh, often uh, uh, result in uh, detrimental effects. Okay. And this is the biggest one. By not using antibiotic therapy in basically for 70% of the cows with mastitis and only for the 30% that really require the treatment, you reduce the, 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 the number of days that that milk has to be discarded. Uh, so basically, you know, those animals were kept separate from the milking herd, and we call it here in the hospital pen, until the milk was normal again. So basically just enough time for that milk to be normal, and then that cow starts to return milk to the bulk tank, and that milk starts being commercialized again. And you can see that uh, the pathogen-based um, group, even with the long turnaround time, which if we do on-farm culture, you're going to have much faster turnaround time, uh, had an average of 5.8 days in the hospital pen versus the blanket therapy that had 8.8 .8 days. So this is three extra days, basically, that you're uh, dumping milk from that cow um, if you choose to treat every cow with, uh, antibiotic therapy, with antibiotic therapy. So in the U.S. where milk is, is cheap, uh, labor is expensive, uh, drugs are not expensive, uh, it turns out that the return over investment for doing culture and culture-based therapy is pretty good. You know, we're talking about over $30,000 if you're uh, per farm, if you're milking 1,000 cows or more. So, and the beauty of it is you can reduce your antibiotic use by half, and yet you can uh, uh, have healthier cows. And that's the most important thing, that you're using less antibiotics and having uh, healthier cows because you're not intervening again when intervention is not uh, going to be helpful. All right, so let's have a, a, a conversation here about uh, each pathogen diagnosed differently. So this is the, the, the product that we developed. It's called AccuMast. It's basically three selective media. Uh, they're selective, you know, we have uh, media number one is the one on the left here. It's a selective media for gram-negative bacteria. And it's also chromogenic. So if you have growth on section number one and the growth is pink, that's equalized. If the growth is blue, that's Klebsiella. If you have growth on section number two, it's gonna be strep enterococcus or lactococcus, and you differentiate them based on the color. Again, it varies from blue uh, all the way to purple and uh, different colors. And section number three is our staph section. Staph aureus will grow in pink coloration, and uh, all their staph will grow in different colors from green to uh, blue and, uh, and so on, in white. Uh, so when you have culture negative, basically you're gonna collect your sample from your mastitis cow, What's the, what's the process? Identify the cow with mastitis. Now I'm not going to uh, treat that cow with antibiotics, not yet. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna disinfect the teat, I'm gonna collect a clean sample into a, a tube, and I'm going to culture that milk. So I'm gonna take a, a sterile cotton swab and, and saturate each section of the media. I'm gonna invert the plate and incubate it uh, at, at, um, in an incubator for a period of 16 to 20 hours. And then I'm going to interpret the results. If there's no bacteria, then the plate is going to be clear, no, no, no growth. And typically, you know, when you have no growth, uh, we need to discern, again, uh, infection versus inflammation. Today, uh, after, you know, dozens of microbiome studies looking into this and intervention looking into it, and many of them from our group, Heracornel, we're pretty confident that most of these culture negative cows 
Uh, they don't have a mysterious pathogen. Uh, they're, for the most part, um, self-cure cases. These are animals that were infected and they have cured themselves. Obviously, some of these cases could be staph aureus that uh, have you know, relapsing shedding of uh, bacteria. It could be Mycoplasma bovis, which is an anaerobic bacteria and requires you know, extended incubation period in anaerobic conditions. But for the most part, uh, not the case, okay? All right, so this study uh, we did, George was actually uh, here or just leaving uh, our group when we did the study. Um, and he was, uh, you know, one of the uh, investigators in the USDA grant that funded this study. Erica Ganda, now a professor in Pennsylvania, uh, an assistant professor at, uh, if I'm not mistaken, University of Pennsylvania, was a grad student in our lab. She ran the study amongst all the other people that worked in the lab. Uh, the goal here was to look at uh, uh, gram-negative infections. What's the effect of treating these gram-negative infections with antibiotic versus not treating them on the microbiome, bacterial load, inflammation uh, markers, and so on. And also culture negatives. You know, the idea that is there a mysterious path pathogen associated with these culture negative uh, cases? And you know, I can tell you uh, ahead of time that there isn't one, and it's basically all inflammation. Uh, but we did use microbiome uh, technology to resolve this question. So we had a cow that, uh, and this was a uh, naturally occurring disease, mastitis. Cows were affected with uh, mastitis, we collected milk sample and we cultured them. Cows were infected with gram-negative infections, E. coli or Klebsiella, or culture-negative or enrolled in the study. We were randomly allocated into receiving a daily dose of ceftiofur, intermammary uh, infusion, versus not receiving anything. We collected samples, you know, uh, in the first five days for microbiome, culture, qPCR. On day eight, after diagnosis of mastitis, we did it again, did a clinical score as well for a clinical cure. And then day 10 and day 14, we did clinical scores again in qPCR uh, to look at bacterial load. Now, when you look at uh, clinical cure, this is basically uh, animals that uh, obviously, uh, in, in this case, you were talking about the uh, culture negative, no bacteria found there. So when we treated them for five days of ceftiofur, there was an 80% clinical cure rate. And the control groups that received nothing had a 77%, and the p-value here is 0.73, which is extremely high. So we can uh, really, uh, there was no difference in clinical cure between treating them and not treating them. And this graph is, is interesting. We have so much data from this uh, study, and I can't share all of it with you guys. But in, you know, if you look at the upper graph, this is basically um, from a, uh, a study that we challenged the cows with E. coli. When you challenge them on day zero, you can see the inflammation picks up by 12 hours, 18 hours, and inflammation stays flat. Inflammation here measured by linear scores. And by the time we finished this study of this very intensive study of these cows, they were uh, uh, their mammary gland was still inflamed when measured by somatic cell counts in the milk. But you can see that, uh, that bacterial counts, CFUs, this is, um, uh, we did CFUs and also did um, microbiome. So this is microbiome uh, percent of enterobacteriaceae. You can see that it grows, the amount of bacteria explodes. It, 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 it really blooms after that uh, very fast. But as somatic cell increases, bacteria decreases. And by about 160 hours after that, it goes back to nothing but inflammation is still there. So what we're seeing here is, particularly for E. coli, E. coli, when it gets into the mammary gland, it lights up like a Christmas tree and it, and it, and it, and it really invites the immune system to visit that mammary gland. So neutrophils will infiltrate the mammary gland and will clear that infection very effectively. Now, the problem is the inflammation doesn't get resolved very, uh, very fast. And these cows may, have subclinical mastitis, even though they're not infected, they may still have subclinical mastitis 30, 60, 90 days after this event. 
So it kind of snowballs and we don't know how to resolve the inflammation. But the bottom line is giving antibiotic to these cows does not change, does not change the outcome uh, of inflammation. Okay, so, you know, and this, Pamela Rook published this uh, decision tree analysis uh, in 2011. And you can see that, in, you know, in, in, in her conclusion, basically reviewing the literature, uh, treating or not treating cases of culture negative, we end up with about 90 to 95% uh, cure, clinical cure. In fact, of course, they, they're, they're already, they're, they don't have an infection. So, so the clinical cure is 90 to 95% regardless of using or not using antibiotic therapy. And this is pretty uh, widely accepted. We should not be treating these cows. Oh, E. coli. I know there's um, today, if you really look at the literature and you evaluate the literature in, in, uh, in the, the body of knowledge that we have about E. coli mastitis, I think most people would agree that using intramammary therapy for E. coli infections is a bad idea. And the literature is very strong on this. So this is how E. coli growth looks like in the Acumast uh, diagnostic system. It's basically not gonna have growth in the white media, which is the strap or the staph media. And it's gonna have green, uh, pink uh, growth in the gram negative media. So you're confident uh, that this is E. coli. And when we evaluated this in research, again, comparing not treating them with five days of safety of cure, this is what we found. Clinical cure, 75% uh, of them were clinically cured, and if I'm not mistaken, this is a 10 days after diagnosis, uh, when they were not treated with antibiotics. When they were treated for five days, 70%, again, no difference whatsoever. Bacteriological cure, they were all infected on day zero, and then 85% of them were free of E. coli, uh, in the control groups, not receiving any antibiotics, and 80% of them in the Ceftiofur group. Again, it doesn't matter. Um, it does not help to put any intramammary antibiotic in this cows. Again, the you know if the, the bulk of the literature agrees with this, using or not using antibiotics uh, does not change anything. You know, we're talking about 80, 90% cure rate uh, for these animals, regardless. All right, so what do we recommend for E. coli? Intramammary antibiotics are not recommended for E. coli infections, independently of the mastitis score. So people are reluctant about this, and we need to trust science in this case because there is enough literature saying that it doesn't help. Now, why it doesn't help? Well, uh, E. coli, it's, it's alien for the mammary gland. It's so immunogenic that it doesn't require antibiotic therapy. The, when, you put, when E. coli gets into the mammary gland and starts blooming, the immune system notices immediately. And the immune system is very efe efficient in clearing the infection by E. coli. So that's all we need to do. It's let the, let the um, uh, immune system do its job. Now, why do we need antibiotics for streptococcus? Well, because the immune system is not as good in identifying streptococcus and killing it. So we need to help the cow, we need to help the immune system. In the case of E. coli, cows died because of E. coli infection, not because of the E. coli itself, but because of the death of the E. coli. When neutrophils infiltrate that mammary gland and kills large amounts of E. coli, it releases tremendous amount of endotoxins. So by treating those cows with antibiotics, you're Potentially, you know, if you're using bactericidal uh, antibiotics, we're potentially increasing the amount of endotoxin that is released by, uh, by those cows. So, in, and that's probably why you look at larger studies that, that the, the survival of E. coli cows that were treated with antibiotics is decreased compared to not treating them with, uh, with E. coli. Okay. Now, we're basically talking about moderate mild cases, one and two. What do we do if the cow is not systemically sick? We just wait. That cow needs to resolve her problem without antibiotics. She doesn't even need uh, anti-inflammatory if she's not a score three. Now, if she's a score three, she's a severe case of E. coli, then we need to do a lot of things. Well, uh, if, she, if the cow is sick, dehydrated, febrile, depressed, uh, no appetite, uh, inflamed, large mammary gland, watery secretion, 
piece of sick cow, we're not going to do intramammary therapy of that cow. But it, systemic antibiotics are actually helpful, and there's good science showing that it helps. So it's not a contradiction, and I'll tell you why it's not. Uh, the recommended antibiotic in this case is actually ceftiofur systemically. And we know that ceftiofur does not cross the barrier and does not get into the milk. Uh, so we're not treating the infection in the mammary gland, we're treating a potential septicemia. So if a cow is a score three and she's sick, actually using systemic broad spectrum antibiotic is a good idea. So we're gonna do that for um, uh, equal I grade three cows. We also gonna use uh, uh, fluid therapy. Like I like to use hypertonic saline, two liters of hypertonic saline IV. We have a 7.2% hypertonic saline. Um, it's, if you look at the work of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lance uh, Baumgard, the replacement of calcium in these cases of endotoxemia is being questioned now. So take this with a grain of salt. Uh, as a clinician, we still use calcium borogluconate uh, to treat these uh, acute cases of uh, endotoxemia and E. coli and Klebsiella, but this is scientifically being questioned, uh, that there is a reason why the immune system is sequestering the calcium and, and making them hypocalcemic. Uh, but you know, this is, uh, prob we're probably gonna learn more about this in the near future. There's some good papers from, from Lance that were published this year actually on this. The other thing that is important is anti-inflammatory. It's very important. Here we use, uh, for these cases, we use uh, flunixin maglumin uh, often for, for these cases. Now the beauty of our product that we created is uh, Clubzella and E. coli, they secrete different enzymes and we put di different um, chromogens in the media. So Clubzella always grows in the gram-negative section with a color blue. Uh, so you can separate Klebsiella from E. coli very easily. Klebsiella is a totally different uh, infection compared to, uh, to E. coli. And uh, there's good evidence now uh, in strengthening that we should be treating Klebsiella if you want to uh, save some of these cases with intramammary therapy compared to, uh, you know, opposing, opposing to, to E. coli cases. So Klebsiella is the biggest killer of cows in our region. Um, it, you know, if you look at it, it's, it's less frequent or common than E. coli, but the damage that it causes to cows is, is bigger. This is a survival curve and you can see that, you know, healthy cows survive better, uh, but you know, Klebsiella and E. coli cases, um, they're not as viable. Very interested in Klebsiella. We actually developed a subunit uh, recombinant vaccine um, that there was a beautiful project that we did reverse vaccinology. Started with uh, sequencing the genome of 200 uh, Klebsiella pneumonia isolates. And we identify a main brain protein that is common, preserved in, in, in all cases. We're able to, uh, to rescue 100% of challenged mice from mortality. We took it to the field and we're able to decrease Klebsiella pneumonia infection by 50% when cows were vaccinated with, um, uh, with the subunit vaccine. And this, this protein is also present in E. coli. So uh, we're happy that uh, we're also present, uh, preventing some cases of E. coli with this uh, subunit vaccine. A little bit more about Klebsiella. I think now that we have diagnostics to separate Klebsiella from E. coli in the field, uh, we're learning a lot more from Klebsiella than we used to know. But historically, if you open a book, a uh, bovine medicine book, and you go to the mastitis section and you talk about Klebsiella, it's going to be associated with shavings, wood shavings for some reason. So sawdust, uh, particularly green sawdust, is when we saw Klebsiella in the past. Klebsiella is eliminated in the, in the manure of infected cows. The environment is the source of infection. The perception is that the occurrence of this pathogen is increasing rapidly. Maybe it's just because of better diagnostics. Common cause of mastitis in compost barn, freestyle barns bedded with recycled manure or uh, shavings and uh, sawdust. Outbreaks in sand bedded freestyles are not rare. <coughs> so, you know, this is uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis. Um, uh, each column represents a pattern of DNA breakdown and, and composition. You can see that 
uh, we in this study looked at hundreds of isolates from uh, 10 different farms. And for the most part, they're all different. Uh, with this exception here, this is an anecdote that I'd like to share with you guys. Klebsiella is uh, an environmental pathogen. It's not contagious. It does not go from cow to cow like strep ag, does not go from cow to cow like uh, Staph aureus. When I saw this pattern here, this was all the cases from one farm. You can see that this bar here is flat. It's basically indicating that all the isolates were exactly the same. They're the same isolates. So when I saw this in one farm, I thought, well, this farm has a contagious kind of Klebsiella. And then uh, 10 seconds after I thought about that, I was like, that's stupid. It can't be. Klebsiella cannot be contagious. So called the veterinarian and said, well, there is a common source of contamination in this farm. We need to figure out where Klebsiella is growing and, and, and it's being transferred from cow to cow. And it turns out that the water that was being used to rinse the milking parlor was pumped from a beaver dam. And the tank was contaminated with a single strain of Klebsiella. We were able to find that uh, Klebsiella strain in the tank. We cleaned the tank, sterilized the tank, sanitized it and the problem went away. And this was a farm, a beautiful farm. They used dry, new sand, really well maintained. They never had a Klebsiella problem. And we identified the problem with Klebsiella contamination in the water. So, you know, sometimes we're tempted to say that a microbe is becoming contagious, but it's not the case. It's not, uh, this is basically a, 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 an environmental problem. So this is the genomic data saying that, you know, the, the, the genome of the Klebsiella pneumonia isolates from dairy cows are very similar to the genomes of Klebsiella pneumonia that were isolated from humans. Um, and they shared the very same uh, virulence factors and they caused this in a very similar way. Um, in, in, and this is the work that uh, was the foundation for our vaccine development uh, that uh, hopefully eventually is going to hit the market uh, and help uh, prevent this disease from happening. All right, so Klebsiella, what are you going to do with Klebsiella? If the cow is a, a clinical store, score three, we're going to hit her with our uh, palliative care uh, package, basically fluid therapy, two liters of hypertonic saline, calcium dextrose, anti-inflammatories. Uh, we may use broad spectrum systemic antibiotic therapy and based on recent work from our group and from uh, Pamela Rube's group as well, there is a benefit of extended therapy with broad spectrum antibiotic mm -hmm. intramemory for these Klebsiella cases. Um, you know, the probability of cure is not great. We're talking, you know, 60% uh, cure versus 30%, 40% cure if you're not doing anything, but uh, it's much better than not using antibiotic therapy. So contrary to E. coli, these Klebsiella infections persist and the immune system does not do a very good job clearing them without the help of antibiotic therapy. So when you say extended therapy, we're talking about eight days of intramemory um, uh, antibiotic therapy. Pseudomonas is another one. It's going to have this yellow coloration. It's a, it's a sporadic microbe unless you have a water quality problem. Again, you know, it's common when you're using uh, cotton towels that are poorly uh, cleaned. They're not well sterilized in the milking parlor. When you have poor quality water, there's not treated. Um, sporadic occurrence can occur in outbreak-like situation when a single source of contamination is detected. Chronic and does not respond to therapy. Dry uh, the quarter off or call the cow. In severe cases, you may have to do the palliative care like the other ones. You know, we, we have the ability of uh, identifying many other cases, serratia um, uh, and enterobacter and other cases, and they're pretty much the same. You know, if it's a gray tree, you're gonna do your palliative care. None of them uh, require uh, antibiotic, uh, intramemory antibiotic therapy. Right now, the, the microbes that we're actually going to be treating. Now, if you see blue growth uh, on the upper section, the section that actually has this opaque white pigment, that we did that so that you can navigate the diagnostic system, the dark blue coloration is going to be your Streptococcus uberus. Streptococcus uberus uh, benefits from extended therapy. 
It looks like, you know, if you treat it for only two days, you end up with 60% cure rate, a five-day therapy is 70%, an eight-day therapy, 80% uh, cure rate. So today we recommend uh, intramammary antibiotic therapy extended with, a, you know, a broad-spectrum antibiotic, um, five to eight days. We do not recommend systemic antibiotic use. And if it's score three, we also recommend the, the palliative care. I know that strep uh, egg and strep dysgalactia, they're both going to grow in this uh, light blue coloration. Uh, it's not common. You know, I deal a lot with strep agalactia outbreaks in, in Brazil and China and in Mexico. Uh, but I know that the UK is past that. And uh, like the US and uh, most of Europe, uh, we have uh, taken care of strep egg for the most part. Um, Antibiotic therapy, intramammary, and you, about 5% of the cases will be chronic and have to be called. Other streptococcus, for the most part, are going to be strep dysgalactia. We also recommend short, uh, you know, narrow spectrum, short uh, intramammary antibiotic therapy. Enterococcus, it's uh, sporadically found. It has this purple, beautiful coloration. It's easy and reliable to identify. Uh, you treat it just like strep dysgalactia, you know, use of uh, intramammary antibiotic of choice, protocol of short duration, uh, work well. Lactococcus, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on lactococcus because lactococcus lactis is, um, has become a, a bigger problem than, than, uh, than, than, than what we've seen in the past. Uh, and we, I had to work with a few outbreaks of Lactococcus lactis here that have been very interesting. So it grows into small colonies. They vary from white bluish colonies to uh, this, pur this purple kind of beautiful looking uh, colonies. Uh, it can be sporadic. You find a few cases here and there, but it can also behave in an outbreak type situation. Um, and they're very different. So we published a paper in the Journal of Dairy Science. Marjorie Rodriguez is, um, uh, she's still a postdoc in my laboratory and it's been, uh, she's incredibly productive. She did this work uh, with us. And we sequenced the 16S gene of uh, several isolates from different farms that were having outbreaks of Lactococcus lactis. And, you know, in this case, uh, the majority of the isolates, which is this cow numbers here, were uh, tightly associated with Lactococcus lactis, and we had one isolate that were uh, tightly associated with Lactococcus garvii. So we know that the species is most likely Lactococcus lactis. The funny thing is that the farms have very similar profile, DNA profile, and this was, this was not, um, um, uh, th this was done by PCR, the randomly amplified polymorphic DNA. So it was not in us, not pulse uh, field uh, geolocophoresis, but by, by PCR. But nevertheless, it seemed like there were too many uh, profiles that were identical. So it looked like this, some of these bacteria were behaving uh, in a contagious form, which could very well be. Um, in the bulk tank, uh, we identified it in, in the clinical mass studies case, we identified that uh, the microbiome of these samples were dominated by uh, Lactococcus genus uh, DNA. So what do we do about it? Well, if, you're, if the farm is dealing with a Lactococcus outbreak, um, it's pretty dramatic actually. It, 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 it looks like an outbreak of Staph aureus. Um, it, it, the, a lot of cows get infected, particularly the very, very high producing dairy cows. Uh, they don't respond well to antibiotic therapy. Uh, new, more and more new cases pop up all the time. It's really hard to control. Uh, so what we did for those herds that were dealing with an outbreak type situation like the caucus, we uh, segregated animals who were positive, created a lactococcus pan. Uh, we called the animals that were chronic, they were not responding to therapy, and we were very aggressive with antibiotic therapy, with extended uh, intramammary antibiotic therapy, five to eight days um, in these animals. So 
you know, we treated these uh, cases as outbreaks and, and segregated animals and called animals that were chronic and so on, very much like we would treat the uh, Staph aureus outbreak. If it's sporadic, which is the case for most farms, you're gonna find the case for every 200 cases of mastitis, you just deal with it as a strep uberis case and, and move on with life. Uh, I don't know why, it could be virulence factors present in certain strains, or it could be uh, some susceptibilities in milk routines and milking equipment. I don't know why lactococcus sometimes misbehave as a contagious agent. All right, we're, we're wrapping this up and I'm gonna make this presentation available for you guys and uh, uh, through Caliber, hopefully you, you're gonna have access to it. There's some more that I'm not gonna have time to go through, but now we're gonna talk uh, quickly about the non aureus staphylococci. And it's gonna grow in this staphylococcus section. I told you we have, you know, the staphylococcus section here, uh, the selective agent is actually salt uh, all Staphylococcus genus uh, bacteria are very resistant to salt. So we load this uh, media here with salt. Uh, and the only thing that grows in this media is Staphylococcus um, uh, type uh, genus bacteria. And we have different kinds of chromogens in here as well. Uh, so the white collar and the blue collar, the white collar is uh, usually Staphylococcus chromogenes and the blue collar Staphylococcus hemolyticus. You know, there's a dozen different uh, NAS bacteria. They're all very similar in the, uh, in the kind of disease that they cause. There are two different things, you know, particularly first lactation animals. If you culture healthy cows postpartum uh, heifers in first lactation, you go there in 10 days of milk, collect the milk sample and you culture it, you're gonna find that a lot of the cows are positive for these uh, Staphylococcus, uh, Chromogenes, and even Hemolyticus. Um, but they don't get sick. And there's actually some science showing that if you're positive, but they're not sick in the immediate postpartum, they actually do better uh, than the ones that are uh, negative. Uh, so we don't do anything for these cows uh, when you're uh, dealing with healthy animals. But if you're culturing clinical cases of mastitis or subclinical cases of mastitis, and they return a culture positive for NAS, then you should treat them as if they were uh, any kind of gram-positive infection. So we don't ignore uh, NAS when they are associated with disease. We treat them with intramammary antibiotic therapy. So this is just a study from a, a current postdoc of mine, Thiago Tomasi, when he was in Brazil. It's basically showing that, and this is a very laborious study. I recommend that you guys read through this, uh, this study. But as a, as a second, it basically concluded that it is a secondary pathogen. When it's found in animals that are not sick, it does not affect the milk yield or milk solid contents in dairy cows evaluating contralateral quarters. 80% of the subclinical cases are caused by uh, Staphylococcus chromogenes, and this is in Brazil. Um, and so on. So it's a pretty mild case of mastitis. But again, if it is associated with uh, disease clinically or subclinically, you should treat that with intramammary antibiotic therapy. And the last one, we can also differentiate, and this, our media is uh, incredibly accurate. Uh, it's very accurate for all the pathogens that we uh, showed, but it's incredibly accurate for the determination of Staph aureus. So if you have growth in the third section here and the growth is pink, then it's the, the, the microbe Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and as you know, and, and this is with nearly 100% accuracy, it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, accurate tool for diagnosis of Staph aureus. And you know a lot about Staph aureus. It's a microbe that I learned uh, to respect um, you know, in my career, I had the um, fortunate but unfortunate experience to deal with several outbreaks in, of Staph aureus, and I don't uh, mess around with Staph aureus. I typically uh, cut the, 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 the bad by the root, and if I diagnose Staph aureus, I either segregate or call the animal immediately. Uh, if it is an outbreak, obviously, you know, I've worked with cases that 40% of the herd was infected with Staph aureus. You can't recommend culling 40% of any herd. Uh, but if it's possible, it's actually the best way to get rid of it. 
we worked with a farm that had a thousand milking cows and 200 of them were infected with staph aureus. We uh, messed around with uh, uh, segregation and milking them uh, right before we washed the system, treating them for about a year. And then uh, talking with the owner, we decided to basically to sell all 250 animals who were positive in the herd and buy clean heifers. And that was the only way that we were able to uh, turn this around. So Stephorus is a pain. All right, so I have a few more slides. I, I'm not gonna have time to go over because I wanna give time for George to, uh, to, to talk about the UK perspective. And we're gonna take questions uh, in the end. And George, I hope uh, I didn't, uh, we still have time. It's fine. I, I think people are still with us. We're going to run like maybe 10 minutes late, but I found it extremely interesting. So I hope that everybody else will stay Good. with us for questions. Uh, are you, yeah. So I'm taking over from Rodrigo. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, the plan was since the beginning that my presentation will be a lot shorter anyway. We want to give a lot more time to our U.S. speaker, but we thought that it may be interesting uh, for me to just like uh, go a little bit, share some thoughts on uh, on, the, on the on the U.K. perspective. Uh, so just let me, yeah, uh, Rodrigo, you're the only one I can see. Can you just note if you get my screen now? Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, I'm George Economa, I'm a professor of uh, cattle health and welfare here at uh, the University of Liverpool. And I was lucky enough to work with Rodrigo uh, for a few years. Uh, it's been a while now. This is like nine years ago, actually, when I started there. Uh, it was a great experience. We did some really good research there together. And uh, I'm now doing actually a lot of research on lameness, but I'm still very interested in mastitis, and I still do my clinical work at the universities to run uh, herd investigations with the students. And most, a lot of the times we do investigate mastitis. So I thought I'll share a few thoughts and I'll take just five to 10 minutes, I think, uh, to cover what uh, I have here. Where are we with mastitis in the UK? Overall, we could say that there is great progress. I, talk, I think a year ago I was asking Roger Blaui about mastitis when he started practicing like 40 years ago and he was telling us that yeah, it was like a lot worse, maybe more than 100 cases per 100 cows per year. We're now around 30 cases. And actually, I use this slide a lot in my lameness lectures. Farmers now consider lameness a bigger problem, but mastitis is still there. It, it's a huge concern and it's a massive welfare issue uh, coming together with, uh, with increased cost for the farm. But the slide I wanted to spend a minute on, and I think it links with some of the, of the, the things that Rodrigo uh, shared with us, is that we still use a lot of antibiotics uh, because of mastitis. So if you look at this uh, graph here from work uh, done uh, by the group at Nottingham, the University of Nottingham, you can see that yeah, our dairy farms use a lot of injectable antibiotics. Some of them actually are to treat mastitis, but the, a large chunk a large proportion of the antibiotics we use in UK dairy farms are for dry cow therapy here and for uh, uh, treating mastitis with, this is the intramammary uh, tubes that you use for lactating cows. And I was almost surprised to see this, that we actually use, when you compare the tubes we use, the courses we use for dry cow therapy and intramammary uh, therapy in lactating cows treating mastitis, we actually use more cubes for, to treat mastitis, even though most farmers will uh, uh, use dry cow therapy. I think we've been using selective dry cow therapy a lot more lately, and that's probably reflected here. So that made me think that they, I'm thinking about this. We use a lot of uh, intramammary uh, tubes to treat mastitis when Rodrigo just covered extensively that we may not need uh, to do this uh, in many cases. So that's a question I have here from the UK perspective. I think we have done a lot to reduce antibiotic use on our farms. We've done really well. What else can we do? 
Uh, and I start with something that to me is a given for problems like mastitis and lameness. I think managing starts with measuring it. And I think with mastitis, we actually do a much better job than lameness. We have a lot of information. For the sake of time, I'm not going to spend too much time, and hopefully most of you are already familiar, but I like going a bit deeper than just looking at the bulk tank somatic cell counts and looking at individual uh, somatic cell counts we get from our milk recording, using analytical tools like TotalVet, which I, I like a lot when I analyze mastitis data. We can pick, pick specific trends. This is just an example where you look at the proportion of your cows that were dried off with a low somatic cell count and then uh, picked an infection up. So you clearly see a trend here, this farm, the last few months, the cows are calving down with new infections, we need to go look at uh, how we dry them off, where we keep them, how do we manage the transition period, and so on. So a good start before we even go into selective dry cow therapy and what do we do uh, with uh, treating mastitis, a good start in order to reduce this antimicrobial use is to manage mastitis better, look at the data, make decisions based on the data, uh, and address management issues. I don't have a lot of time to go in these things extensively. I just thought I'll share some examples. This is another graph that looks at how our cows that have are dried with high somatic cell counts uh, are getting better or not after calving. And you see here that this farm was consistently kind of below the target we had. 30% uh, of the cows that were, with, were dried off with high somatic cell counts stayed uh, infected had stayed with a high somatic cell count after calving. The last couple of months things are getting better. And I also think it's really important to record clinical mastitis. It's a lot better with somatic cell counts and milk recording, but recording clinical mastitis cases on your software, analyzing it, again I'm using total vet as an example here, can add a lot more information. And in this area I think a lot of our farms can get better. But if you have good data, you, that adds a lot more information. This is an example. For example, you see your uh, incidence rate over a year. And you can see that uh, this is also making a comparison between this year, which is the blue bars, and the previous year. And you can see clearly that there is a clinical mastitis issue on this farm. Things are getting a bit worse. And when you're breaking down, this by month of lactation, you can also see that the biggest problem is immediately after calving. Again, we go back into looking at our transition cow management, how we manage calving, our fresh cows, and so on. Uh, and AHDB just recently launched a, a fancier tool, a fancier way of looking at this data. Again, the group of Nottingham from Nottingham and, and Cumin, Cumin Mess are behind this. And I think they've done some really cool work uh, allowing farmers and, and consultants and vets to use the existing somatic cell count and clinical mastitis data and, and do some pattern analysis that will do it for you, will give you the most likely explanations. For example, when we look at your somatic cell count data and your mastitis data, we think you mostly have environmental mastitis during the lactation or you have problems coming from the dry period and so on. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be really sophisticated. I have these pictures because these are real life things from my consultancy, from going out with, my, with the students and working with dairy farms. We still see pictures like this, which means that before we even go in the fancier stuff, there are some things sometimes you need to address the basics. These are close up cows. So your close up cows are like this. You, definitely going to have problems with mastitis immediately after calving. And this is a nice way to look to show farmers. It's a simple thing. I actually picked that from me and going to cooking was doing this and I thought it was a nice thing. You go during milking, once the preparation of the other is done, you just before clusters are on, you just go with a clean uh, uh, cotton or swab or something, wipe the teeth. It should be squeaky clean. There should be nothing there. If you have environmental mastitis and you get this, that means that your milk preparation is not great. So there are things, simple things we can try. We have the data we can look at. 
Uh, obviously, this, these things we could expand, we could run a whole day, I think, with Diego, uh, instead of an hour webinar that is already running 10 minutes late. Uh, the last thing I have is a few thoughts on another, other ways of reducing anti antimicrobials. We have, as already said, I think we're doing really well with selective, selective trichal therapy. A few years ago, I remember when people started pushing for this and some of the key milk buyers started requiring this. A lot of farmers were concerned. There was a reaction, and I think now most farmers will do it with great success. I have specific examples with farmers I work with that were very cautious and now it, for them it's a no-brainer. It's like it doesn't make any sense to use antibiotics in all your dry cows if they, if they are uninfected, if they have low smart cell counts, if they don't have a history of clinical mastitis. And this approach already led to a significant reduction in antibiotics use. Uh, the tools Rodrigo is talking about, I'm really interested in, not just because Rodrigo is a good friend, that's a disclaimer, Rodrigo is a good friend, but I think if we have good, accurate uh, on-farm culturing tools, we may even start using them for selective trichal therapy just to inform our decisions a bit better. But what I really want to, I'm really thinking about it, even though it's not widely adopted, I think, at the moment, is the things that Rodrigo was talking about, uh, clinical mastitis. And I'm just going to use an example, and that's the last slide I have said I will keep it quick and short. But uh, I'm just working with a farm the last year with some problems with clinical mastitis. And as part of these investigations, at some point, I convinced the farmer to just collect samples before using antibiotics, just freeze them because we couldn't submit them. It was just like a little project we did. I said, next time I'm going to do a consultancy visit with you, we'll just get all the samples from your freezer and just run them in our, in our lab. So this was done in, in our university lab. Just 18 samples, but it's a good example, I think. Uh, so that's over a few months period that he collected all the mastitis, some all the mastitis he had, sampled them before using antibiotics, uh, well-trained in getting clean samples. And look at what we got. Seven no growths, six E. coli, one yeast, it is only four animals that would need uh, treatment with antibiotics based on, on the research uh, that I think is quite convincing on no growth E. coli. And obviously, candidates, the yeast, there's no point in using antibiotics. It's actually probably making it worse. So that really makes me think, it's just in one example, but I'm sure there are a lot of farms that will be like this. You can still use the labs to do your investigations, make your decisions whether you should go this way or not. But I do think there is scope. Obviously, this is, to me, that would make a lot of sense economically when 80% of your samples, 80% of your mastitis wouldn't need treatment with antibiotics. But it's also the question of reducing uh, the antimicrobial use. Uh, and I think that may even be over the economics question. Uh, and with the pressure from milk buyers to reduce antimicrobial use, that could be a uh, thing to consider. And I think that's, I did promise that I'll be fast. I did just 10 minutes. I hope people will stay for questions and discussion, even though we did run a little bit late, because I think Rodrigo said some really interesting stuff. Mine, I don't know, not so much. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll, I think, uh, I don't know if Ben is going to moderate the discussion. I don't know if we have questions on the chat, but I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you so much for staying and listening. Okay, thanks very much, George. And thanks, Rodrigo, for that. Some, uh, some really interesting slides there and some, some good points for discussion. We've had a few questions through. Um, so firstly, Sorry, I'll just share my screen. Um, Rodrigo, someone's asked, how long do the plates take to develop once you've um, once you've plated? Okay, it's a uh, the, the media that we use. It, it's basically a culture plate, right? So the the time from plating to reading is recommended is between 16 hours and 20 hours. The media is incredibly uh, 
rich bacteria grows very fast, but it depends on the bacteria. So E. coli, um, you know, you can see growth of E. coli. Our clients say, you know, as soon as six, seven hours after you incubate. But what we recommend is six, uh, it's um, between 16 hours and 20 hours, 24 hours after incubation, which works out pretty good, at least for us, you know, because we milk cows here in the US, uh, East Coast three times a day, West Coast for the most part, two times a day. So when you diagnose mastitis, you collect that sample, that cow goes to a hospital pen and next day in the morning, when uh, you're milking her again and, and making decisions, you have already uh, an outcome. You already know uh, what you're gonna do with that cow. So it works out pretty good, uh, the timing. Okay, great. Uh, a second question coming from Edward, um, who is a current user of the Acumas plates in the UK. Uh, and he said that he's seen growth in all three of the sections on the plate. Is that quite common? And do you have any suggestions on a way forward in treatment? Okay. So it's quite common, and I'd say 15% of the cases uh, even, to have uh, mixed infections. So what is a mixed infection? Well, it's a cow that has an E. coli infection and has a uh, strep uberis at, there at the same time. Uh, so if a cow grows E. coli and strep uberis, I will treat that cow with antibiotics because I'm gonna treat the strep uberis. I don't care much about the E. coli. I wouldn't treat if it was pure E. coli infection, but I would treat if she had uh, strep uberis growing. So, but there is a difference between a mixed infection, which is typically two pathogens, E. coli and strep, E. coli and, and uh, a coagulase negative staphylococci, and so on, and a contaminated sample. You gotta be careful because when you get a dirty sample, then you get growth everywhere. Uh, you get E. coli and Klebsiella growing in the gram-negative section. You get strep and Enterococcus growing in the strep section. You get uh, different types of uh, Staphylococci growth. So, you know, if, you, if there's growth everywhere, or different kinds of bacteria, it's typically a contaminated sample. And I would resample that cow with more, uh, being more criterious, you know, just trying to be cleaner and collecting the sample. Great, thanks Rodrigo. Uh, another question, do you think the Acumas plates are suitable to be used by farmers and can they be expected to differentiate pathogens themselves? Okay, so that's a good question. We uh, definitely, the answer to that question is definitely yes. You know, most of our uh, clients are farmers, although uh, in different parts of the country and different parts of the world, uh, veterinarians buy our product to provide the service to clients. Uh, this is basically a logistical uh, option and, and, and the vets are providing the service uh, using our product. It is very simple to, to collect your samples, plate them and interpret the results. Uh, what I would do is uh, have a conversation with your veterinarian and get into an agreement on what are you going to do with the different kinds of diagnostics and uh, be on the same page with the veterinarian because he is the one that should be advising you on how to treat these cows. Uh, and then once you're on the same page, the farmer and the, the veterinarian on a plan of action, it is very simple for the farmer to uh, collect the sample plate and interpret the results. But again, it's important to have the veterinarian being uh, an integral part of the plan uh, because he's the one that can advise you on the proper use of antibiotic and treatments and, and, and so on. Okay, and another question come in. Do you think that Acumast um, should be used in every mastitis case? Should it be used randomly or just in those cases that you cannot treat? Uh, if you're going to get the benefit of, of the program, I tell people like, that, you, you, you know, Acumast is basically just a tool that is facilitating the system. The, the, the important thing is the system. What is the system? The system is basically a cow gets a mastitis case. She, she's diagnosed. We know that 
there are different kinds of microbes that cause mastitis. Some benefit from uh, antibiotics, others don't. Uh, some you need to do different um, kinds of antibiotics, different duration of therapy. So this is the system. Acumast is basically allowing you to implement the system. Because before, you know, we knew all these things about pathogens, but you couldn't uh, differentiate pathogens like Klebsiella versus E. coli, uh, Strep uberis versus Strep dysgalactia versus Enterococcus versus Lactococcus, uh, Staph aureus versus Staph hemolyticus. They're all different. They all require different interventions. So to answer your question, we definitely would want to culture every cow with mastitis because then you can personalize her therapy and you're not gonna harm the cows by giving antibiotics when they are not going to benefit from antibiotics. And you're going to uh, intervene in cases such as strep uberis or strep dysgalactia or enterococcus or lactococcus or, or staph hemolyticus uh, when the, the treatment is required for, for, for improvement of the animal. So every clinical mastitis cases and also every uh, subclinical mastitis case should be, if you're interested in doing that. Now, if you start doing selective therapy of clinical mastitis, you open up room to do other things in your farm. So I'll give you an example. I had a, a thousand cow dairy farm that had a huge mastitis problem. So what you're doing is you're getting five or 10 cases every day of mastitis and you're treating everybody for five days and you have another three days of milk with hold. And so you're, you're, you know, you're stuck with those cows for eight days. Now do the math and you're gonna have a, a hospital pen that is huge with tremendous amount of uh, effort, labor to maintain that and a tremendous amount of money going down the drain because you can't sell that milk. If all of a sudden you, you only treat 30 or 40% of the cows, your hospital pen goes from 100 cows to 40 cows or 30 cows. And it opens up room for, oh, now I have room. I can, I can tackle my high somatic cell count cows, the subclinical mastitis cows. I can do other things and, and start improving my milk, overall milk quality. So, so that's the beauty of the, the system that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, that allows us to, to do more uh, with fewer resources and save money and do the best for the cows at the same time. Okay, thanks, Drew. Yeah, the questions really are coming in thick and fast now, so I'll try and cover um, as many as we can. If we don't cover them, because I'm just a bit conscious on taking up time in your evening. Uh, we will get back to you all individually and, and obviously feel free to send them across. But another question in from Sarah. Um, would you always recommend treating the staph, uh, Haemolyticus and other strap, uh, staph? What would be the likelihood of self-cure with stripping and using anti-inflammatories if using on an organic farm, for example? Well, it's, if you're in an organic farm, then you're, uh, there is not much you can do, right? Because uh, I don't want to treat those cows. Our, some of our organic farms are huge in the U.S. And what happens is if they get a treatable case of mastitis, they'll treat them and ship them to a non-organic farm. That that's, you know, keeps the organic farm organic. But you know. now, you know, I can't really comment too much about organic uh, therapies and you know, non-intervention in these cases. My experience with the non-aureus staphylococci is if you, if you identify these pathogens in clinical disease or even in subclinical disease, uh, they should be treated with antibiotic therapy. They're only benign when they're found in healthy cows. That's the research. The research is, you know, that's saying that the staph, the, the non aureus staphylococci uh, is considered benign when they're identified in animals that are not clinically or subclinically diseased. And it has more to do with the immune system of the animal and the tolerance that that animal has towards that pathogen than the pathogen itself. So the interesting thing is the same group that has been advocating that these are uh, not, not pathogens, 
they did an interesting study. What they did is they, uh, they isolated uh, the bacteria from the, uh, the cows that were healthy, but positive, culture positive for, if I'm not mistaken, Staphylococcus carmogenes. Um, and then they inoculated in other cows were culture negatives. When that happened, and you take the bacteria from the healthy cow that, that were colonized, and you in, uh, introduce it in a healthy cow that was not colonized, she developed mastitis. So it is a pathogen. It's not a benign microbe. It's not a, a probiotic. It's a pathogen. The difference is that the, uh, the cows that are tolerant, for some reason, their immune system allows them to tolerate a certain amount of these, uh, these microbes in their memory gland. Uh, that's also, it's associated with the presence of this microbe in their memory gland. It's also associated with more positive outcomes, including milk, uh, milk production, milk yields. So it has to do more with the immune system than the bacteria itself. If you're asking me, if I find cows that are non RS staphylococci infected and they're clinically diseased, I would definitely treat them with antibiotics. Okay, a few, there's, uh, there's a, there's a, there is quite a lot of questions, so I'll ask quite a, uh, quite a, a few more and then uh, we'll have to wrap it up. But also a nice comment is coming from James Yeatman, just saying that he's been using for two or three years now with great success, uh, predominantly E. coli, so made a good saving in terms of treatment already. And he'd strongly encourage people to use the plates initially to gain understanding of issues on farm. And then once the confidence has grown, uh, to use the information to adjust treatment. I, I, it's a great advice. I think it's uh, like anything in life. If you take one step at a time, it's it's better. So if you start uh, culturing your uh, milk samples to to understand the microbiology in your herd, you know, do I have um, uh, an E. coli or a Klebsiella problem, or uh, or do I have Staph aureus? Uh, you know, it gives you perspective in how to prevent the problem from happening? Is it an environmental problem? Is it a contagious problem? And so on. And then as a follow-up step, then you implement your uh, therapy based on the pathogen. And I appreciate that, James. Thanks for the for sharing. And I'm, yeah, I'm glad yeah. you're having success with it. Uh, question from Nicola Rodrigo. How important is it to incubate at the correct temperature? And is there any buffer in temperature required? Well, uh, temperature is important. Uh, we have uh, people that have tried to avoid buying an incubator, even though they're not expensive at all. They're, they're cheap and they last forever. We, in the US, we sell an incubator for $300 and there are farms here that have been using the same incubator for five years in a dusty, uh, dirty uh, environment and the incubators are surviving well. So they're, they're a pretty uh, reliable investment and they keep the temperature uh, at the required you know, uh, level. They, they have temperature controls. The problem of using, some people have used ag incubators. Those ag incubators have no temperature controls. So they get too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. Um, so it's not good. I mean, I've, I've had people, I have a client in Mexico that put a box uh, uh, in, on top of a, uh, of a radiator of an engine in the, in the engine room, uh, and he was incubating plates in there. I was like, well, it, I think it's better to buy an incubator. So it's, it's not a big investment if you think about it, and, and it, will, uh, it will pay off eventually. So uh, the other thing is, regardless, if you use an incubator, and this is true, as you know, as a microbiologist, I'll, I'll give you a tip. Even if you're using an incubator, just put a glass of water inside the incubator, keep it full all the time. This will keep the media from dehydrating. Um, doesn't matter what you're using. If you're, it's always good to maintain uh, relatively high humidity inside the incubator to keep the plates from, uh, from dehydrating. Hey, thanks, Rodrigo. Another qu a question coming from Ian Coleman. Uh, it says that the research supports the use of targeted rather than blanket antibiotic use. 
Is there any danger that antibiotics will become less effective if used inappropriately? Well, that's, Ian, I agree with you 100%. That's everything that I've been saying for the last uh, 60 minutes is that we should target, uh, but uh, I don't know if you're saying targeted based on any uh, antimicrobial antibiotic sensitivity assays? Is that what you're, 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 you're talking about MICs? Yeah? All right, so the problem with that, Ian, and I had a conversation, I was giving a talk in Spain and I was very blunt uh, to the audience. I think it was in the NAMBI meeting in Spain, which is a fabulous meeting. And somebody asked the question, should we run sensitivities on, uh, and, and on this? I say, well, there is a, uh, there, there's a problem with uh, being able to implement a system. What we're doing here, you know, we're basically telling the farmer to be patient and not treat that cow for 24 hours. And most farmers are gonna understand that. Don't treat that cow for 24 hours, and then you treat based on the genus of bacteria. All right, Klebsiella is a tough gram-negative microbe, and you don't want to use a, uh, a gram-positive specific antimicrobial to treat Klebsiella. So you are directing antimicrobial use based on the species of bacteria that's causing the infection. On average, if you run your sensitivity, antibiotic sensitivity assays on 100 Klebsiellas, you're going to agree that yes, you know, broad spectrum antimicrobials are effective against Klebsiella, whereas gram positive antimicrobials, specific antimicrobials are not. Uh, so you can select based on the, the nature of the infection. Uh, and that's good enough. Now, if I run, if I send a sample to the lab, and it's going to take 48 hours just to get identification and another two days to get uh, sensitivity assays done. By the time you got your results back, uh, you know, it's just, it just way too past the, the optimal time. So I think if you compromise, compromise and say, all right, I'm going to, first of all, if I implement this and, and I get farmers on board, I'm going to drop the antibiotic use by 50% right away, immediately. Because, you know, he's not going to treat the culture negatives, not going to treat E. coli. And then he's going to direct uh, therapy based on the species of bacteria. Strep Huber is one, uh, one antibiotic, one duration. Strep Dysgalactia, another one. Klebsiella, another one. And, and Staph, another one. So that's the compromise. So I don't, we don't do, not a single sensitivity assay, MICs are done for mastitis cases in the US unless you're doing it for research. Not even labs, nobody runs it. We just care about the species. Just care about what is the cause. And then you can direct antibiotic based on biology. You know, it's, I'm going to use broad spectrum antibiotic therapy for this and, and narrow spectrum for uh, other ones. Okay, uh, and a question from Alistair Fletcher, uh, who I, I believe is a vet. Um, he said that he, he finds the majority of farms that he deals with, um, strep uberus is the biggest issue. And with this in mind, is he right to be concerned that culturing to determine treatment versus no treatment on these farms could be detrimental to the chance of curing if it's strep uberus is cultured and treatment has been delayed, even if only for 16 hours? Uh, all right, so we have a paper uh, that is uh, under review right now, Journal of Dairy Science, that we got um, two different kinds of antibiotics, uh, one broad spectrum, one narrow spectrum, in a, in a negative control, mainly treating strep uberus. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, no, it's not going to change anything at all. And there's enough data to say that, you know, waiting 24 hours, the study by um, Amy, the, the one that I uh, showed you, the Journal of Dairy Science study, showed quite the opposite. You can see that the majority of the gram-positive infections in those cases were uh, strep uberus. And those strep uberus infections um, in the selective uh, therapy group 
they waited two to three days because they were not done on the farm. They were actually sent to the lab. And the outcome, in every single way you look, in any way you want to cut the data, the outcome was supportive of waiting and treating. So I cannot see any data to support that a 24-hour delay in treatment or even a 48-hour delay in treatment, even for strep hubris, can be detrimental uh, to the outcome. Once you start therapy on those animals, they're going uh, to they're do just as fine as the, uh, the animals who were treated at uh, the same time. And just so that I'm very clear about this, strep uberis is the most common pathogen that we find in basically every farm uh, in New York State. So that's the uh, most common pathogen. And, and nevertheless, um, uh, selective or, or pathogen-based therapy has become the norm here, finally. Uh, most people are doing it one, one way or another. Uh, and, and we haven't, you know, no compromise or no evidence that we're losing in cure rates of uh, being, you know, uh, bacteriological cure rates or clinical cure rates. Okay, great. Thanks, Rodrigo. I'm, uh, I'm a bit conscious of the time now, guys, so I think we'll have to wrap it up there. But thanks again for, uh, for all of your attendance. Um, I appreciate it. It's, a, it's been a bit of a late one, and a lot of you will be up very early. Um, George, Rodrigo, thanks again for your... Uh, uh, ben, one remark here to Gregor. I hope he's still there. Um, Gregor, as a, I understand your pain, man. I, I know that waiting 24 hours as a farmer is difficult. Now, uh, I also would like to tell you that the farmers that are reluctant and they don't want to do it and they don't want to do it, and then they finally get their heads around and, and try, 100% um, of them never go back uh, to treating every cow. Just because they observe the cows and they see that um, the ones that are going to get better get better and the ones that are not going to get better regardless they don't get better so i know it's a it's it's a pain it's an obstacle that you need to get through but you should uh, give it a try so yeah thank, thanks very much for, for your attendance uh, and george and rodrigo thanks again for your presentations they were brilliant um We'll, we'll follow up with all of you in attendance uh, with an email with our details on, um, a little more detail on Acumast and any more questions that we've not covered, if you, if you fire them back over, we'll respond as soon as we can to them. Um, other than that, thanks very much and hopefully speak to you all again soon. Thank you. Have a good night, guys.